The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Improving Time to Diagnosis of Non-Cystic Fibrosis Bronchiectasis, The Importance of the Radiologist in Fulfilling Unmet Needs of Patients. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash TXG860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Uh, welcome to today's session entitled Improving Time to Diagnosis of Non-Cystic Fibrosis Bronchiectasis, the Importance of the Radiologists uh, in Fulfilling Unmet Needs of uh, Patients. Uh, joining me today um, is Mary Salvatore, who's Associate Professor um, at uh, Columbia in New York, and I am Chuck Daly, um, and I am Professor of Medicine at National Jewish Health and Chief of the Division of Mycobacterial Respiratory Infections. All right, let's begin. So first, let's get on the same page. What is bronchiectasis? This has been variably defined, but most definitions uh, include this, that this is a chronic disease, not an acute disease, and is characterized by permanently dilated and inflamed airways. Uh, most patients have a chronic productive cough, but, but not all. You've all heard of the dry, bronchiect uh, br dry bronchiectasis. And the word derives from the Greek bronchus plus is ectasis, which means stretching of the airway. Most patients present with a cough, probably 80%, but then we have that few who don't. Most patients have sputum production. Um, another very common uh, finding is fatigue. I'd say also probably close to 80% of patients describe fatigue, uh, shortness of breath, mainly for those who have more severe disease. And then, of course, they can cough up blood. They can have chest pain and weight loss. It turns out bronchiectasis is increasing in prevalence, and there are now a number of studies that actually have documented this, both in the U.S. Uh, and other countries, including uh, various countries in Europe. Uh, the estimated population in the U.S. is somewhere between 350,000 and 500,000. So that's, that's a lot of people with bronchiectasis. And I would venture to say that most people who have bronchiectasis have yet to be identified. And again, that's where you will come in and help us find these cases. Now, prevalence increases with age, uh, significantly so, uh, somewhere between eight to tenfold higher prevalence in those who are 60 and older compared to younger age groups. For reasons we don't know, it's more common in women, but that, that really becomes more evident uh, as we age. Uh, and the prevalence has been increasing. Some data that you see here uh, in these figures shows that it's been increasing for about almost eight to nine percent per year. Uh, there aren't many diseases you can think of that are increasing at that rate. Uh, the, the figure of prevalence there with the color bars just make the point that the um, prevalence increases dramatically with age. And again, we start to see women outnumbering men, um, uh, particularly as we get older. Uh, and the figure on the right is the annual prevalence. Now, these are a little bit older, but I would say this is the study that kind of woke us up that bronchiectasis is, in fact, increasing. And you can see both in men and women over this time frame of 2000 to 2007, uh, significant increases. How do you get bronchiectasis? Well, it turns out a lot of different diseases, as we'll look at in a moment, can produce bronchiectasis, but the, the pathway to bronchiectasis is probably similar. Uh, the initial description of the pathogenesis is on the left. That's the Cole's vicious cycle. The idea was probably something caused lung damage that resulted in uh, abnormal mucus clearance, subsequent colonization with bacteria or moles. It could be other infections. And then that led to neutrophilic inflammation through the release of proteases. And for the last few decades, uh, basically our treatment approach has been to target one of these items in this cycle to kind of break the cycle. Uh, more recently, Patrick Flume and others said, you know, this is a lot more complicated than that simple cycle. And they proposed this idea of a vicious vortex. The idea is that you can move from each of these circles without going in a cycle but really uh, in any direction that you can think of. Ultimately, they're very similar. One is just making the point that it is complex. Now, there are a lot of reasons people get bronchiectasis. When you do the best workup you can do looking for the cause, still about half of patients have idiopathic disease. We can't really find a reason. Um, Non-tuberculous mycobacteria, another disease that has been increasing at about the same rate, about 8% per year, uh, this is a chicken or egg argument for many years, is does the NTM cause the bronchiectasis 
or do they get the NTM because? And the answer, of course, is yes, yes. Both can occur. Most patients have bronchiectasis, which is what makes them susceptible to get NTM, but untreated NTM can clearly lead to additional bronchiectasis. Cystic fibrosis is really kind of the classic model uh, of bronchiectasis, and one of the things that we look for, particularly when we see upper lobe disease. We're seeing more and more patients with autoimmune disease, not only rheumatoid arthritis, but we see a lot of patients with Sjogren's who have underlying uh, bronchiectasis. And in fact, at National Jewish, Sjogren is more likely to be associated with bronchiectasis than rheumatoid arthritis. And also inflammatory bowel disease. If you go to many GI doctors, they will tell you that this does not happen, that their patients with inflammatory bowel disease do not get bronchiectasis, but we all know they do. And the reason they say that is but they don't get it uh, when they're seeing them. They get it after the colectomy, and they, about a year later, they start coughing, and they come in with bronchiectasis. By this time, the GI doc's not following them anymore. So they're really not attuned to this issue. Uh, other things, uh, primary ciliary dyskinesia, uh, AVPA, these are, again, kind of classic things that we, we know. COPD, as many of you know, can also be associated with bronchiectasis. Uh, some of the times, uh, it's not that they have bronchiectasis, that, that airway ratio may be off, but it's really because the vessel itself is smaller. And immunodeficiency, another group that is growing um, out there, either because we're giving them biologics, uh, I, I don't know all the reasons, but we see patients sometimes with common variable immunodeficiency that will have particularly lower lung zone. These are the kind of things that as a clinician I'm thinking about, you know, could this be the reason my patient has bronchiectasis? This is a typical algorithm. They're pretty complex, um, but I think the most important part of all of these algorithms uh, is right here. Um, I can think someone may have bronchiectasis because they have a, a chronic productive cough, but until I get a CT scan, I'm not going to have that confirmed. So this is really a key area of interest is to make sure that this is being diagnosed at this stage. Once that happens, then my job is to try to figure out why. So I've mentioned, we look for CF with sweat chlorides, immunoglobulins for immunodeficiency, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, uh, looking at nasal nitric oxide, which is to diagnose uh, ciliary dyskinesia, uh, uh, auto screen, uh, autoimmune screen, and workup for ABPA. Uh, and again, after I do all of that, it's still 40 to 50%. It's idiopathic. Okay, how do we treat this? So it turns out that the, the treatment varies a lot from patient to patient. After all, you just saw this is a very heterogeneous disease, and so the treatments that we use are going to vary from person to person. And frankly, they're difficult for the patient. They take a lot of time, things like airway clearance. Uh, some of the drugs, like inhaled antibiotics, may have side effects. And we unfortunately know that we create antibiotic resistance by giving things like inhaled antibiotics or macrolides. Um, and what we like to do is really think about just treating the patient based on their stage of disease, more of that in just a moment. And we've been moving and trying to get closer and closer to this concept of a precision medicine. As part of that, a number of indexes and indices have been developed. This is one called the bronchiectasis severity index. It's one that many of us now fill out on our bronchiectasis patients. It was actually developed for clinical trials, but we find it useful to see if our patients are progressing or not. Um, and one of the important things here is there is a radiologic component. So some of us are speaking to our radiologists and saying, when you see a patient with bronchiectasis, will you comment on this issue? Do they have three or more lobes involved uh, or less? Because that helps me very quickly uh, uh, calculate this. And believe it or not, this really correlates very well with uh, how the patient will do. If we take this score from this index and divide it into mild, moderate, and severe, you can see the four-year mortality increases dramatically. And those people who have severe disease, it can be up as high as 30% in a study. So this is, we find very useful uh, prognostically for us. Uh, and we'll find out more as we use it, whether or not it's also uh, clinically uh, helpful. So the objectives in a therapy are really prevent exacerbations. That's the most important thing, so I'll talk more about that. Uh, reduce symptoms, improve quality of life, stop disease progression and reduce mortality. We do this through improving airway clearance, providing antibiotics for treatment or prevention of infections, and using anti-inflammatory drugs. Currently, the only one that we have is the macrolide. 
So we don't do that to everyone. We take those items and we do it in kind of a stair step. So we start at the bottom left and people who have mild disease will probably just do airway clearance. Um, if they progress or develop more moderate disease, we might use inhaled steroids if they have reactive airways. Otherwise, we never use inhaled steroids and bronchiectasis. They've been associated with an increased risk of MTM. And we may add macrolides to those people. And then as they progress, then we start getting into things like, should they have lung transplants? Should they have surgical resection? Um, and so it's this idea of building the therapy based on the severity of disease. So I, I've used the term exacerbation. Uh, this was recently defined for clinical purposes. Basically, they're getting sick. Their cough is getting worse. Their sputum production is getting worse. They may be getting more short of breath. And a clinician has decided that they need a change in therapy. Usually, it means they're going to start uh, antibiotic. Now, exacerbations are bad. They've been associated with increased airway inflammation. Uh, they've been associated with more severe outcomes, particularly for frequent exacerbators and those who have pseudomonas. Uh, we know that their lung function declines in follow-up, decreased quality of life, and also increased mortality. And also very common. In a study in Europe, about half of the patients had two or more exacerbations per year, often leading to hospitalization. This is to just to give you an example of what I mean by that. Here we see hospitalizations, looking at the number of exacerbations, and we can see that when people are having uh, over three, about 40% over a four-year period were hospitalized. And this is looking at survival. This is that bottom line are those who have three or more exacerbations. You can see it greatly impacts their survival. And also the infection they have is important. Uh, this is looking at hospitalization over four years and pseudomonas. Uh, over 80% of people who grew pseudomonas were hospitalized over a four-year period of time, followed by gram negatives. It also impacted their mortality. Again, 20% mortality over four years in people with bronchiectasis who grew pseudomonas. But why don't we prevent these things from happening? That's really the approach we should use. The only two ways we can do that is to identify these people who are having frequent exacerbations, improve their airway clearance, if they have pseudomonas, the recommendation is to give them inhaled antibiotic, something like tobramycin. If they don't have pseudomonas, then it's to give them a macrolide. And some patients end up needing both, and I have a number of patients who have combined. But there was a recent meta-analysis that actually showed that macrolides also work not only for non-pseudomonas infections, but also pseudomonas. So most of us now give macrolides before we give inhaled antibiotics, regardless of the infection if they are frequent exacerbators. So why, why don't we do it better? Is there something we can do that would be better than what we're doing? Because we really need a therapy. You've seen the, the, what happens to these patients in terms of mortality. So what we know is that the people with bronchiectasis usually have neutrophilic inflammation in the airways. And these neutrophils, they contain what are called serine proteases or NSPs. Uh, probably the most notable is that it's neutrophil elastase. And it turns out there's an enzyme called D, uh, DPP-1 or dipeptidopeptidase that's in the bone marrow, and it, it actually helps mature uh, the neutrophil. So when it goes out into the systemic circulation, it is primed and ready for inflammation. So what happens then if you were to inhibit the enzyme so that you would not be able to activate these proteases? Well, that's what's been done. This was a phase two trial with a drug called brinzacatib. Uh, it was published in the New England Journal. We published this about uh, two years ago, three years ago. And this was the primary outcome, which was time to exacerbation. So here we are over the study period, and these top two lines are two doses of brinzacatum. This is, again, a, a DPP-1 inhibitor compared to placebo. So it was very significant. It met, it met its primary outcome. It also met several secondary outcomes. This one, another very important one which was the frequency of exacerbations. So here you can see both doses of brinzacatib had less exacerbations than those uh, who were on placebo. Um, and this was also statistically significant for both doses. So the final story is it's not all about neutrophils. There's about 20% of patients who have high serum eosinophils. Uh, and there are a couple of drugs that are anti-IL-5 uh, anti um, and anti-L5 receptor antagonists that have been shown to really work in patients who have severe asthma and bronchiectasis. This is just five patients that were reported from Italy. These are the number of exacerbations. You can see anywhere from one to six. And they were started on one of these two drugs for their asthma. And look what happened to their exacerbations. They almost disappeared. 
So this is another mechanism um, uh, that we have to consider. These are the drugs that are coming your way. These are why it's important for us to make a diagnosis of bronchiectasis more than ever, because we actually will have drugs for our patients uh, with bronchiectasis probably within a year or two. So the, the summary is basically this is a cycle that we have to, of inflammation that we have to stop. The diagnosis is often delayed or missed. You all are the ones that can change that. When you see these scans, please be sure and mention bronchiectasis. And there are novel agents coming, which is why it's important. So I am now going to step back and hand this over to Mary. Thank you very much, Dr. Daly. That was a wonderful discussion. Um, thank you all for being here. So let's start with the definition of bronchiectasis. Bronchiectasis is the irreversible. So if something gets better, it's not bronchiectasis. Dilatation of the bronchus bigger than its accompanying artery. So who's going to make that diagnosis? We're going to write as radiologists, in order to say that the bronchus is bigger than the artery, we're going to have to call it on our CT scans. And sometimes it's going to be very subtle, so we have to have an eye out for it. In this case, there's a very minimal amount of bronchiectasis with bronchial wall thickening. Do you see the signet ring signs in the right lower lobe of um, just a little bit of dilated airways? We're expected to call this bronchiectasis so that the patient can begin treatment. It's not good to start too late. so. Um, we should encourage ourselves to include that in our reports. There are some things that can cause false negative evaluation of bronchiectasis. Like what if the pulmonary artery is exceedingly small, like happens with high, high, low, high altitudes or patients with smoking, then the bronchi may look big. And sometimes the pulmonary artery can be very big from pulmonary artery hypertension, which might make the bronchi look small. But we really need to, um, those are exceptions. Usually if the bronchus is bigger than the artery, we need to call bronchiectasis. You know, from the trachea to the alveoli, it's 26 branches. 16 of those branches are conducting airways, bringing the, uh, the air towards the alveoli, and 10 of them are respiratory bronchioles. A quick review of the conducting bronchioles. When I look at this picture, I can't help but to see um, the right upper lobe bronchus looking like, what do you think, a goldfish cracker. Now you will never look at the right upper lobe bronchus the same or goldfish crackers. And the branches of the right upper lobe bronchus are anterior, posterior, and apical. The middle lobe bronchus has medial and lateral, which is helpful because middle lobe initials are ML, medial, lateral. The right lower lobe bronchus looks to me like a compass. It has an anterior, posterior, medial, lateral, and then an apical. So 10 branches to the, the right upper lung, to the right lung. And on the left side, everything is combined and made smaller because the heart is there. In the left upper lobe, the apical and posterior are combined. And in the lower lobe, the anterior and medial are combined. And the way I remember that is AM like a clock. So grading bronchiectasis, I love this article by Lynn Reed. I can't imagine that in 1950, um, she published this in Thorax. And what a wonderful paper to read. If you have a long plane ride back home, I'd recommend it to you. Um, so Lynn Reed looked at 45 lobectomies, and she took the, um, the right lower lobe or the left lower lobe posterior bronchus that I just described to you about one of the branches, and she dissected it. She looked at it on bronchography, which is they inject lipoidal into the, the lungs, and then they take some x-rays. She looked at it macroscopically and microscopically, these 45 specimens of people that, people that had bronchiectasis. And she found that in people with cylindrical bronchiectasis, which is the mildest, they have 16 conducting airways. Just like I said, so they're, they're normal. There are 16 conducting airways in normal people. People with cylindrical bronchiectasis have 16 conducting bronchi bronchi um, airways. In the varicose type, which is a little bit more severe, there's um, truncation of the bronchi, and there's only eight branches. And furthermore, in cylindrical, which is worse, there's only four branches. So what's happening with worsening bronchiectasis is that we're getting rid of some of our branches of the bronchus. So we don't use bronchograms anymore, fortunately. We're using CT scan a lot. And you want to do a good CT scan. You want to use uh, very thin sections. The thinner, the better to diagnose bronchial wall thickening. They're one millimeter sections or thinner. Full inspiration. Expiration is very helpful, especially in early disease, though, because one of the earliest things that happens is bronchiolitis obliterans. And we really can't see that other than to see the air trapping beyond it. And then because of that obstruction, the bronchus dilates more proximally. So even before we can see the bronchial dilatation, we can see the air trapping. 
Um, uh, it's good to give contrast if there's hemoptysis in order to see if the bronchial artery is bleeding, but usually we don't use contrast. So on the CT scan, we see the classic cylindrical bronchiectasis. You see that bronchus is bigger than its accompanying artery and has some thickening of the walls. When Lynn Reed looked at the cylindrical bronchiectasis, she saw less on, on the bronchogram, she saw less branches because microscopically the branches are filled with mucus in cylindrical bronchiectasis. So in cylindrical bronchiectasis, there's not all the branches full. We get those very smooth tram lines because they're filled with mucus. What happens with varicode bronchiectasis is that those areas of mucus now become cords. There's no more mucus. There's no chance for reversibility at this time, but it's wrapped in fibrosis, so a progression of the disease. Here's the classic varicoid bronchiectasis, which is undulating and ends in these bulbs, which is, is classic for varicoid. And cystic bronchiectasis has only four branches. Now, instead of having these cords, there's total disruption and lack of connection. These are um, were thought by the Fleischner, um, th by Dr. Fleischner, to represent distal airways because they look so cystic and dilated. But Lynn Reed showed that they connect to the trachea. So we talked a little bit about how dilated a bronchus is, but I think a lot of radiologists would like to be able to create a wonderful grading system about how many bronchi are sick. And um, one of the great interesting this grading systems that I came across, not one is used everywhere, is BRICS, where they look at the degree of bronchial dilatation and also accompanying emphysema. This has good correlation with FV1, FEV1, the amount of purely of mucus, and also um, with the amount of hospitalizations. So we talked about the degrading of um, bronchiectasis, but what can, can we be more specific? And just besides this radiologist saying that this is bronchiectasis or this is not bronchiectasis, can we say what kind of bronchiectasis this is? So first, I think we should look at whether it's focal or not. There's not much of a differential. If you see focal bronchiectasis in one bronchus, it's either bronchial atresia due to a congenital infection, and then you see um, hyperaeration surrounding it, bronchiolithiasis, which might have been more common when TB was more active. You have a lymph node that's calcified. It erodes into its bronchus, and it causes bronchiectasis. A foreign body would look similar to this as well. And then some kind of cancer within a bronchus is also going to cause a dilated area airway. Those are the three kinds of focal bronchiectasis, but more commonly we see more diffuse bronchiectasis. And when we see diffuse bronchiectasis, I'd like you to think about when it's central, right? If it's central, our differential becomes, meaning we said that there are 16 um, conducting airways. So central would mean like the first to the fourth to the eighth branch, more centrally located. munier Crohn's is a lack of smooth muscle around the trachea and the bronchus, and it causes the bronchi and the trachea to become very dilated, as in this case. And then the patients get secondary infections, and that causes the bronchiectasis part of it. So if the smooth muscle is missing, the bronchus is dilated to greater than, the, I'm sorry, the trachea is dilated to greater than three centimeters. You need the right bronchus to be more than 20 millimeters, the left bronchus to be more than 18 millimeters in, in order to correlate or suggest Munia Kuhn's disease or tracheobronchomegaly. ABPA is very common disease, right? Not very common, but more common than the other bronchiectasis. This is also a very central bronchiectasis. It affects the first to the fourth branch of it. It has what's called a finger in a glove appearance um, with the, the fingers being the mucus and the glove being the dilated bronchus. It's an upper lung disease predominantly, and I'd like you to remember that. Upper lung and central, allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis associated with asthma, and um, cystic fibrosis, which is another part of the clinical history that's very important. And here's another more milder example of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis in the um, lingula. Williams Campbell is a very interesting ant mini. Have you seen Williams Campbell? I was surprised when I saw this across my desktop. So instead of affecting the first to the fourth branch, Williams Campbell affects the, say, the fourth to the sixth to eighth in different resources. So it's not the proximal, most proximal, it's kind of like the middle and not the distal, and it gives this characteristic appearance. It's a problem with the cartilage, so the test to absolutely confirm that it's Williams Campbell is you ask the patient to expire, the bronchi will collapse in size, and then the diagnosis is Williams Campbell. Upper low pr um, predominant fibrosis, cystic fibrosis is probably the, the best example of upper lung bronchiectasis. Um, it, I'm from Columbia, and they say that we discovered it at Columbia. They said that Dorothy Anderson um, noticed that babies who were 
um, salty, had salty skin, had uh, died from respiratory complications and named it cystic fibrosis. We see in the right upper lobe bronchus an aspergilloma in this patient with cystic fibrosis. Sarcoidosis is also going to cause dilated bronchi in the upper lungs, but this is a little different than the bronchiectasis that we've been talking about because this is a traction bronchiectasis. It's not an inherent problem with the bronchi itself, but rather the lung that's fibrotic that's pulling the bronchus over. So it's in the differential, but it has a different mechanism of action and a different treatment. The right upper lobe bronchus, I showed you this before, and I looked at about 100 people that had normal lungs, and the right upper lobe bronchus always comes out like a right angle from the line that um, touching the sternum to the spine. Do you see that? With sarcoidosis, look at how that goldfish is pulled backwards. Because sarcoidosis affects the back of the upper lobe, it always pulls the bronchi backward. In contrast, cystic it's, um, uh, chronic hypersensitivity pneumonitis affects the anterior part of the upper lobes and pulls the goldfish forward. I help full sign. Tuberculosis is another upper lung predominant bronchiectasis that has a predilection for the back of the upper lobes, just like sarcoid and the superior segment of the lower lobes. Whenever I see cavitary lesions with bronchiectasis in that location, I'm almost certain that it's gonna be um, post-primary tuberculosis. Middle and lower lobe disease, MAI. I was just saying, four times a day I might see MAI on my desk and it could be very subtle um, to find. So you wanna make sure that you note the bronchiectasis. You see the signet rings here in the right middle lobe and the lingula. The bronchus is bitter than its accompanying artery, which is such a key feature to this disease. Lady Windermere's disease. My mother's 85, and when she coughs, I'm like, cough bigger, ro more robustly, right? Get that mucus up because you don't want to. I'm just going to be embarrassed that I mentioned her here. Ciliary dyskinesia is a lower lobe disease also. And um, when I see someone who's usually a 25-year-old male, and they have recurrent pneumonias, this is, and I see the bronchiectasis in the lower lobes, I think about ciliary dyskinesia. Um, here's another example of ciliary dyskinesia. If they have situs inversus and they also have polyps and sinusitis, we call it cartagnos. That's about 50%. The other 50% might have yellow nail syndrome. They have yellow nails or um, uh, azospermia, young syndrome. So it's like a whole different group. Ciliary dyskinesia, cartagnos is one of them. 50% are other ones. And then recurrent infection from aspiration can cause bronchiectasis in the lower lobes. Sometimes the bronchi are dilated in the lower lobes, and it's not because of the bronchi itself, but there's fibrosis like we see in UIP. You see those black holes in the periphery of the lung here with the fibrosis around it. This could be nothing else but a fibrotic lung disease because of those black holes. We usually don't see the bronchi in the periphery of the lung one centimeter from the pleura. And that can progress to honeycombing, which is not um, the kind of bronchiectasis intrinsic to the bronchus, but because of the fibrosis. NSIP is another disease that causes lower lung predominant bronchiectasis. Again, though, this one is because the fibrosis is pulling the bronchi open and treated differently. We talked about some direct signs of bronchiectasis. Some secondary signs of bronchiectasis are bronchial wall thickening, mucoid impaction, tree and bud opacities. And then secondary signs, if it's an inspiratory CT scan, we say it's mosaic attenuation and air trapping on expiration. Here we see the bronchial wall thickening mucoid impaction. Is it an endobronchial cancer or is it mucoid impaction? Sometimes that's an important question. And I think it's um, about the straightness of the edge with mucoid impaction compared to the roundness that occurs with the carcinoid. Helps you the differential measuring the density of the mucus. It's going to be fat density versus um, soft tissue density with a, a carcinoid. And MRI T2 weighted images are supposed to be helpful with that as well. They're using those more frequently in Europe. Tree and bud opacities. This is commonly associated with bronchiectasis, and it represents mucus in the 24th to the 26th branch of that whole thing that I showed you from the trachea to the airways. It's the smallest airways. It was described in tuberculosis, but it can happen in any infection. And I'd just like to go through this with you, the secondary findings quickly. Inspiration, we see the mosaic attenuation. We see the black area and the white area. And you have to ask yourself, is the white area sick or is the black area sick here? The way you do that, you look at the dark area on the first CT scan. Let me put my pointer here. And are these vessels smaller than the vessels in the white area? If the vessels are smaller in the black area, it's either pulmonary artery hypertension or small airways disease. You do an expiratory, if it gets worse, that's air trapping and it's small airways disease, and that's important. So I thought of the summary side. I love mnemonic. 
Um, radiology report tells about bronchiectasis, so in our reports, we should say the type of bronchiectasis, whether it's cystic, cylindrical, cystic, or um, um, varicoid, the extent of bronchiectasis, is, is it focal or is it diffuse, the location of the bronchiectasis, is it central or peripheral, upper lobe or lower lobe, and then the secondary findings, I see mucoid impaction, bronchial wall thickening, and um, that'll be very helpful to our clinicians. So I'll lead off the case. Um, this is one of our patients uh, at National Jewish. This was a, a 37-year-old white male whose uh, chief complaint was a chronic cough that was productive in nature. Uh, he'd been coughing for about seven years, um, and he described these episodes where he would cough up some mucus, some plugs, and then he would feel better for a while. He would feel less short of breath, and he would cough less until presumably they built up again. And during this time, he lost almost 50 pounds. Um, uh, as far as his past medical history, uh, he had a lot of environmental allergies. He had thalassemia minor, and he had, importantly, no history of asthma. Uh, he had had some polypectomies done, uh, sinus surgery, a uh, very, very sh brief smoking history. And environmental exposure, always important issue for us uh, clinically, which is he was a mechanic, and he worked uh, for a garbage dump company, and the garbage dump happened to be right outside his garage where he worked. So he would smell all day the smells of the garbage dump and there would be dust. And he also had uh, asbestos exposure working with brakes over the years. Um, so I'm going to let you run the, the, the chest CT. Thank you so much. So you're all sitting down at your desk and you're looking at this patient. Can we roll it one more time? So it's an upper lung predominant disease. There is um, mucoid impaction, dilated bronchi. So there's bronchiectasis, mucoid impaction. Let's use that. That um, so the pattern is a kind of a varicoid bronchiectasis. It has an upper lung central predominance, and um, so it, it has that kind of um, finger and glove type of appearance to you. Do you are you seeing that as well as a radiologist? Would you feel comfortable with? Um, saying in your report that you think that this is allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, what kind of information would you want to ask of the clinician if this was your patient? You'd want to know if they had asthma or um, cystic fibrosis, that would be a risk factor for it. So I think um, that's what I would be thinking when I look at this CAT scan, okay. that it might be. So you can see this was done in 2020. Um, so, you know, the things that uh, we're thinking about clinicians were like, does this person have cystic fibrosis because they have a very high rate of ABP8? Um, do they have sarcoid, uh, pneumoconiosis, TB, uh, and then ABP8? These are the things that I would say, you know, come to my mind clinically. Um, this was the actual interpretation of that 2020. This was the official interpretation. Interval, and I, this is exact wording. Interval reduction in bulk in the large previous left upper lobe consolidation with now moderately sized patchy nodular opacities in place. Uh, we don't have the previous scan. We never could have seen that. More moderate changes on the right with similar appearing current nodular opacification in the right upper lobe. They did mention bronchiectasis. Thank you. I love that. Uh, Left-sided bronchus was dilated and filled with uh, inspissated materials and a smaller peripheral infiltrate and nonspecific anterior mediastinal um, flip notes. So the, the laboratory findings at the time, the clinician sent a CBC, which showed some mild eosinophilia, fairly marked elevation of IgE. They put skin tests on for uh, various things, and this guy was allergic to everything, but also aspergillus fumigatus, so uh, falling in line with this idea this could be ABP8, and there were precipitants that were positive. Thick, creamy, yellow secretions uh, were coming from the right upper lobe, uh, interesting, the antigen test for uh, aspergillus was negative, uh, but when they looked at the materials, both cytology and the transbronchial biopsy, they saw organisms that were fung well, they saw fungi, and they said they were suggestive of aspergillus, and lo and behold, that's what grew. This was the diagnosis at the time, 2020, that he had aspergillus pneumonia. So he was put on vorconazole, and he did have significant impact, clinical impact, improvement in his cough, well-being. He started to gain weight. But after about a year on vorconazole, his symptoms started to return. He started, again, having a worse cough and a productive cough. Uh, but they continued him. So for two years, he's on vorconazole, but in that last year, still very symptomatic. So he was referred to National Jewish. 
Um, so what did we do? So this is what this is day one presentation. Uh, and there's BMI was a little elevated. Um, it was not hypoxemic, and this again was in Denver. Uh, the only things on exam, he had a little bit of trace pedal edema on his shins, which he did not even notice, and he had kind of diffuse wheezing, but but he wasn't short of breath at the time. Um, so what do you think? This is the x-ray. We got an x-ray before we did the CT. We're at National Jewish. We would have loved to just done a CT, but <laughs> had to do this for insurance. So it's not gone, right? It's, it's um, In fact, it looks like it's worsening on the left side. I'd love to see the, the CT scan. Um, you know we have one. <laughs> Will you let it roll? We'll do it twice so that you can um, get a good look at what's going on. So three years later. Oh, my goodness. So there's a lot of bronchiectasis, and um, it's progressed significantly in the left upper lobe. Um, and there's that hands and glove appearance to it. And um, tuberculosis, I'm not thinking about that because that's usually in the back of the upper lobes, and this is more anteriorly located. And MAI, I've never seen it get that dilated. I mean, I, maybe it, you've seen it get that, like, so thick, so... Maybe not so much hands and glove. You get to see the extreme cases, but by and large, they might be a little bit less than that. So it might help me think not MAI necessarily. Maybe the age of the patient, the gender might be um, helpful with that also. I mean, just in trying to narrow down the best differential radiographically. And then dysmodal cilia, I wouldn't think about it in the upper lungs or with someone who was um, older. So I'm still thinking this is progression of the allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis and... Um, Okay. That ink. So, th so this is obviously what we were thinking, and um, this is the impression. It was not the whole page. It was just this findings of AVPA, which have significantly worsened. Um, and this is the workup we did. So we looked uh, to make sure he didn't have two things going on. So we looked at the immunoglobulins, which were normal, except for a hot, very high IgE, and also IgE and IgG that were specific to aspergillus. Uh, alpha-1 was okay. Interestingly, he had just a slight elevation in the sweat chloride, but I've never seen someone with full-blown CF with, you know, uh, sweat in the 30s. Usually it's uh, 50, 60, and above. Autoimmune screen was fine. Uh, did have eosinophilia, uh, about 30%, which is quite high, and a positive skin test for aspergillus. So PFTs, though. So one of the things that you need to have to be called ABPA traditionally is asthma. Uh, this person had no airflow limitation. They had no bronchodilator response. We did a methacholine challenge to see if we could identify asthma, and there was no airway hyper-responsiveness. So this is when your allergy immunologist says, this person doesn't have ABPA. They don't have asthma. They don't have CF because we did a sweat chloride. So what do they have? Well, we did a bronchoscopy, um, and again, just to summarize, a lot of secretions, not just coming from the right upper lobe, which was what was described previously three years before, but from multiple lobes. The airwaves were very friable and inflamed, uh, some mucosal inflammation. Um, they did uh, a BAL galactomanan for aspergillus, which was negative, um, and there was a lot of eosinophilic inflammation in the biopsy. And interesting. Despite all that you saw, all that mucus and all the cultures were negative. Bacterial cultures were negative, mycobacterial cultures were negative, and the fungal cultures were all negative. So does he have ABPA? So these are the current diagnostic criteria for ABPA. Uh, this is the clinical uh, criteria. Um, asthma, didn't have it. CF, didn't have it. But the current criteria say you must have one of those. But there is a little asterisk. And if you go to the bottom, it says maybe some people don't have asthma or CF. <laughs> so, you know, I like these criteria because now, now I can call this person AVPA. It's not the typical clinical presentation not to have asthma or CF, but it does happen. And, and so this to me is a classic radiographic pattern of AVPA. And, and and that's why we're going to call it that. But he did have everything else on the checklist um, to, to say this is ABPA. And how do we treat ABPA? One of the things that I think is important is that, uh, to your point earlier, if you can give us some idea of the type of bronchiectasis they may have, then the clinician will start ordering the right things. 
because ultimately this is what I have to do is come up with a treatment for that patient uh, and that form of bronchiectasis. And we have treatments now for c particularly things like CF. Uh, we have alpha-1 antitrypsin uh, replacement, uh, autoimmune diseases. We have uh, for immunoglobulin deficiencies. So we have things that we can actually do. And as I showed you, pretty soon, we're going to have probably medications for all of our bronchiectasis patients. Currently, the recommendations are to uh, treat either acute ABPA or recurrent, which is what I would say this patient had, with systemic glucocorticoids. What happened in this case, AVPA was not mentioned in 2020. It should have been mentioned. It wasn't aspergillus pneumonia only. Maybe they did have it, but they had AVPA. This person went two years on an antifungal and never received corticosteroids. That's why you haven't seen cases like this. He progressed. He wasn't treated for two years for what he should have received. Now, IDSA says in addition to that, you should add the antifungal. Not everyone agrees with that. Um, we typically use vorconazole, which is what he received. But nowadays, we're finding these patients who are, they're not responding to steroids, or we can't um, wean the steroids. And so we're starting to give them biologics. So yet again, a reason to make sure we're treating uh, uh, ABPA. We have to be very clear about the diagnosis. And usually these are the kind of things that I talked about before with this TH2 endotype. These are people who have eosinophils and respond to these uh, anti-IL-5 uh, agents. Um, so that's kind of a new twist in the treatment. Now, they're not approved for that. So this is our diagnosis. ABPA, regardless of the fact they don't have asthma, he was started on oral prednisone. Uh, he will be weaned down, and eventually he will be starting uh, venralizumab, which is one of those uh, uh, IL-5 receptor antagonists. We didn't start vorconazole. He'd had two years of it and progress, but his cultures were all negative, so we're just not sure what it would offer at this time. But he may at some point uh, in his future uh, end up with vorconazole too. Does it come back again? Like, will it go away and come back again in your experience? With yeah, this? ABPA is classic for flaring. Mm -hmm. You know, people can be literally quiet for years and then, and then they can flare. And it's the same thing related to the diagnosis. People come in and it looks like ABPA, but our diagnostics, like the, uh, the precipitins are negative. There's something, you know, that's not meeting criteria. But if you continue to follow and repeat those tests, eventually they'll often become positive. Was there something in his environment that, that caused this to happen, did you think? Yeah, I, I don't know the environmental thing. He had a lot of environmental exposures. I don't know, uh, in his case, whether that had anything to do with it. Probably not, except he probably was exposed to moles. You know, this yeah. was also a burn pit type place, and he... He inhaled a lot of things uh, uh, where he was. And again, this gentleman's 37 years old, uh, uh, now about 40. Uh, and most likely, um, if this continues, he, he will be probably transplanted someday. If, really? Yeah. I think at this point it's going to be really hard to stop what, what he's got. could just progress too far. So again, very important what you say in those reports. Uh, they really impact the clinician's uh, ability to work up the patient and it, uh, and uh it can literally change their lives. So appreciate what you do. I love getting to speak with the clinicians and seeing what's important to them. It makes it um, so good for us, too, to improve our report. Yeah. We have some good questions. Yeah. Listen, the first one, let's see. Should radiologists recommend anything after reading HRCT with newly found bronchiectasis? I look to see if it, the, a pulmonologist who's referring me to the patient, and if they don't have a pulmonologist, I might recommend, like I'll say what I think is a radiologist, but then I'll recommend a pulmonary consultation is something that I add to the report if I think it's um, someone that might have experience with um, bronchiectasis. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, you know, the main um, intervention is airway clearance. Uh, most of the time, it's the pulmonologists who do that. But as a person trained in pulmonary, who's now chief of ID, you know, kind of crossed uh, uh, into the dark zone, um, most pulmonologists don't know very much about airway clearance. So I know you think when you get them involved, all of a sudden they're going to end up on a flutter valve and hypertonic saline and vests and all that. No. Uh, at National Jewish, you know, we get people referred from all over the country, usually from pulmonologists and ID docs that coming to my division. And if they're on something, they have never been shown how to use it. 
People come in when they should be blowing in their device and they're inhaling in their devices. You know, I mean, it's just amazing. So we have a lot of work to do on the other side, which is training, or not training, but educating pulmonologists, the importance of airway clearance. What I didn't mention is that airway clearance, particularly inhaled hypertonic saline, has been shown to decrease exacerbations. So, I mean, it, it has been shown to, to improve um, a patient's quality of life. So these are things that we need to do, uh, but still go ahead and send them to the pulmonologist and hopefully they'll do the right thing. <laughs> How often should HRCT be done to monitor a patient? Well, that's a very good question. I don't put a specific recommendation because I'm not sure what it should be. I mean, I think it's probably different for each patient, isn't it? Yeah, I think it's kind of based on that idea of severity, uh, the, also the idea of uh, this uh, frequent exacerbator phenotype. Um, they tend to be sicker, pro progress more. And so I think with time we get a feel for, is this person stable? They're not exacerbating. We probably don't need a lot of imaging, maybe x-ray in between. Um, but, but you do have to look again. And so I think that's your question, like what, when? Um, so if people are frequent exacerbators and we're just getting involved in their care, we, we will usually do an HRCT is six months or, or not, not, not an HRCT, a low dose radiation scan at six months and follow up. HRCT is kind of our initial approach, but later we, we just monitor with low dose. And, and that's because people with bronchiectasis are going to get lots of CTs in their lifetime. So we need to try to minimize that radiation exposure. Um, and so six months, and if that's stable, then we may go to 12 and so forth. So try to get it to as the, the few as possible. If it's progressing, do you, like, so then you go with shorter intervals, or you keep it at six months? Because you won't see much of a change very quickly, I don't think. Yeah, it's a chronic disease. You know, it, it, it doesn't change fast. If it does, it's a pneumonia, and then, yeah, I'm going to do it based on clinical reason. Yeah. Okay, how often should we perform? form, oh, a low-dose uh, chest CT in an asymptomatic patient. You mean an asymptomatic patient with brachiectasis? They do, they do exist. Ooh, that's even a harder question. <laughs> um, how Very smart question, right? Asymptomatic patient, I wouldn't be doing a lot of CT. So I'd probably do a chest X-ray, you know, at some point, maybe in a year, if they're still asymptomatic. Um, most people with bronchiectasis will not be symptomatic forever. As they get older, those airways become more collapsible just relating to aging and their chronic inflammation, and they, they will eventually have symptoms. And as you all know, in clinical medicine, it's also nice to have someone come with the patient. And when they go, I ask them, are you coughing? And they go, no, I'm not coughing. And then their partner goes, what are you talking about? You cough all the time. <laughs> and so think... sometimes they are coughing, and they are so used to it, they don't even you recognize hear it. Okay. Another one, uh, is there a role for FTG PET CT in determining prognosis? So the PET scan is gonna be positive in this areas of inflammation. Um, so it won't, it won't probably add anything. It'll probably confuse the equation and people will start worrying about cancer, maybe doing unnecessary biopsies. So we haven't used PET. Um, in our yeah, we, we haven't used PET uh, in any kind of routine fashion. Um, so no, I don't, I don't know how, I don't know the role of that. Uh, okay. Should bronchiectasis, oops, that jump. Should bronchiac, should bronchiectasis, uh, sorry, it was moving, uh, warrant testing sputum for fungal and mycobacterial cultures? Yes. Yeah, great question. Yeah, so one of the really, uh, in that algorithm, if you go back and we have time and you look at that uh, first row of the algorithm, one of the things we recommend in all people diagnosed with bronchiectasis is a sputum culture for bacteria, mycobacteria, and fungi. So that should be done at the initial uh, diagnosis. We then do them periodically, depending on the severity of disease or symptoms. We may do sputum cultures every three months, every six months. Uh, in cystic fibrosis, uh, we, it's recommended every year at least, uh, and uh, more if clinically indicated. So yeah, good question. What is the prevalence by age and comorbid conditions, for example, discovered incidentally as part of cancer screen? Oof, that I don't know. I think we see MAI commonly in women who are having lung cancer screening. 
and the other disease is not so um, commonly because usually NAI is relatively asymptomatic in many women. So I think um, we see that most commonly, incidentally, MAI, but we have to remember to notify you that we are seeing it, um, even if there's not lung cancer there. Maybe the most important thing that happened was that we found the bronchiectasis for the patient on that CT scan. You know, a, a group, not cancer-related, but a group that we see every year, several cases a year, is when they have an abdominal CT. They go, mm -hmm. in, and then you see in the basis the of bronchiectasis. bronchiectasis. And that's usually early diagnosis. They're often asymptomatic. That's a great time for us to know this person has bronchiectasis. So that is really important to comment on that because uh, uh, now we've made a, an early diagnosis, and we're not going to let that happen to what we saw in our case uh, once we, we make that diagnosis. Uh, the, uh, the role of bronchial artery embolization. I see that after the fact oftentimes in patients with severe cystic um, fibrosis that they have the clips that represented right before they have a transplant that they had a bronchial artery embolization. But I haven't seen a patient presenting with bleeding. Have you seen patients come into you with bleeding? I I'm sure it's the treatment of choice when they have the hapromoptosis that's uncontrollable. Yeah, so hemoptysis is, you know, not an uncommon thing in the setting of bronchiectasis. To, to be honest, I can't believe they don't all have it. When you go and look at their airways, they're just red and very friable. But most of our patients don't have significant hemoptysis, but they have some blood streak. But massive hemoptysis does occur, and we have, at the National Jewish, since I've been there, we've lost patients due to that. Uh, one of our patients was found at home with the phone next to her, dead. Uh, she was trying to call the emergency room, but she died before she could get them. They probably put her on hold. I don't know, but uh, it, it does happen. It's, it is quite unfortunate. And if you've ever seen it, then you know uh, it is one of the scariest things you can see in medicine is massive hemoptysis. Especially because they're living longer now, patients with cystic fibrosis. Are you seeing it more commonly because they're living longer the disease, or because the disease slowed down, maybe not as much? Yeah, no, I, I, the ones I'm really thinking of didn't have cystic fibrosis. See, and, you know, it is an interesting point, though, because Trikafta, the drugs that we have that treat CF, are, that's a little revolution, uh, revolutionizing their, their, their lives. So when I was in med school, the uh, average lifespan of a CF patient, we were talking about this earlier, was 19 years old. It's now 53 years old, and it will be going up and up. But the issue is, did, are we really completely preventing bronchiectasis? Are we now going to treat them, make them more like our non-CF bronchiectasis patients? I mean, they're going to present late. They're going to present in their 60s and 70s. We, we don't know the answer to that. That is the concern. And the reason that's important to me as a mycobacterial person is that I'm probably going to see more mycobacterial infections in them wow. because, it, because it tends to occur later in life. Okay. So... We might be shifting the CF patient in terms of when they get infections and which ones, but they're going to live longer and their quality of life is going to be dramatically better. Is there treatment to prevent progression? You know, I like to think so. I think airway clearance probably is the, can do that. I think probably chronic macrolides do that. Um, but I don't think we'll really have a great intervention unless this drug brings a cat up, gets FDA approved, um, there, or one that list. I showed you that list of uh, drugs that are in clinical trials right now. Um, you saw that. Those five patients who had that uh, eosinophilic, I mean, it just six exacerbations a year to zero. I mean, dramatic. over, And it stayed for two years. So, you know, in medicine, we always say, if I don't have a treatment, what's the point in diagnosing the disease? But one is prognosis. That's very important. Uh, if there's genetic cause for that, that's important. Um, but the, the, there's this issue of can we improve their quality of life and can we stop progression? And I, I don't feel that I have the intervention today to be absolutely certain about that. But I think these new drugs will do it. I think they will do it. We have one last question. Is there a correlation between smoking history and worse outcomes? Hmm. I don't know. I probably should. Probably best to stop smoking anyway. Hmm? Probably best to stop smoking anyway. Yeah, we, we tell people to stop smoking. I think for ILD is supposed to be good, but we don't tell people that. But um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. It turns out most of the people who have the bronchiectasis, the more diffuse type that we see, 
I would say 80% of them are non-smokers. Uh, they don't have a history of smoking. And if they do, it's four-pack year. It's very, very little. So w most of our patients who have that type of bronchiectasis don't smoke. Those who have it related to their COPD, of course, that's a whole different discussion. But the, this other, the nodular bronchiectatic NTM patients, for example, 80% non-smokers. So probably no, no, no correlation there. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, you for coming today. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash TXG 860. This activity is supported by an educational grant from INSMED.